Okay, am I on? Yeah? Cool. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because these guys are keeping me on a tight schedule. Um, it's good to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Bill Hilf, and uh, I run our product management team at HP. And so I'm going to spend uh, 40 minutes on the dot with you to talk about uh, a variety of things of what we're doing at HP, and talk about our work with OpenStack, of course, and tell you about some of our recent announcements that we made last week uh, around HP Helion. Uh, so before I jump in, though, I want to give a little background. I, I'm at HP about a year now uh, and uh, have been enjoying it immensely. Um, and a lot of our team is here. Uh, I'm going to give a little swag uh, call out. We have these nifty shirts that I'm not wearing, uh, as I was reminded, because um, I'm wearing this nifty shirt. Uh, you can get these at our booth, a new logo in the back. We also have a book that we just wrote uh, that's out in the back you can pick up around um, specifically things that we believe are very important around OpenStack adoption in the, in the enterprise. Um, before I joined HP, I, I ran product management teams at Microsoft for 10 years. Uh, most recently, before I joined HP, was running product management for Windows Azure. I uh, ran product management for Windows Server and a variety of other things over my years there. Uh, and I won't go into the resume beyond that. There's all kinds of good tools. You can go and find all my sorted history before that time. Um, but over that time, I, I spent a, a quite, a long, quite a long time over the past five years really talking to uh, literally thousands of enterprise customers looking at cloud computing, adopting cloud computing in some way. Um, customers around the world, every industry I could possibly think of, uh, at all different phases of that journey, moving from traditional systems to some virtualization to trying to understand what a private cloud is, understanding how to use a public cloud, what the value would be, and what, where to start, uh, and frankly, where a lot of landmines are planted at. And so what I'm going to share with you a little bit of some of the things that I learned along my, my own journey there, uh, including some very significant ones at, as part of running Windows Azure and also being part of HP's uh, public cloud, the things that we've discovered um, along the way. The reason I'm bringing this up is I still believe fundamentally we're at a very early time as it comes to the cloud computing phenomenon, for, particularly for the enterprise space. Uh, and I think also as you think about OpenStack and open source technologies, we're also at a very early stage in that overall game. I do think it's interesting that we're now uh, at a point where you're seeing a lot of competition, is particularly in the OpenStack space. As you walk out here on the show floor, you follow the Twitter sphere, look at social media, look at just press about what's happening, we're now really seeing competition come into, uh, into a real light, and I think that's great. I think it's great for OpenStack in particular. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So one thing that we all know and love is, is that developers love to have more and more abstraction. I'm going to share a little story. When, in, when we were building Windows Azure, we started as a platform as a service only offering um, at Microsoft. And I, I'll never forget the day when we introduced uh, infrastructure as a service in Windows Azure uh, that we'd spent a fair amount of time contemplating bringing that to life. And the literally hundreds and hundreds of emails that I received uh, from developers who were using our platform services saying, that I was you know, personally you know, taking the industry backwards, that I was responsible for moving you know, the art of computer science back in time by taking us back to the virtual machine, to back as infrastructure as a service. Um, and what they wanted actually from me was more black boxes, more abstraction that allowed them to move faster, to build applications simpler and quicker. Uh, and we continue to see that today. We continue to hear the conversations, not just about PaaS, but the interest in container technologies, the interest in making it easier to get an application deployed or managed or, or spun up or, or, to or torn down uh, e even quicker. This isn't only about OpenStack. It's not just about other open source technologies. It's a desire for developers to have more and more speed. I would say that cloud computing phenomenally changed the developer experience, largely driven by Amazon Web Services and Salesforce, I, I believe, in, in the beginning days. Uh, and we're really seeing that demand grow even further for the enterprise, both traditional enterprise ISVs as well as enterprise developers. The other key learning is about DevOps. How many of you um, work in an environment where you're actually using real DevOps today? Don't all raise your hands at once, please. How many of you talk to customers about DevOps? Okay, good, because I figured there's a few vendors in this audience. 
Uh, one key learning about DevOps that, that I've seen over the years is, is understanding that DevOps is not really a technology. It's not really a, you're not gonna go out here on the, on the show floor and find some magic DevOps software that's gonna transform you or your, or your customers environment, it's a philosophy, it's really a cultural change that, a, that an IT department has to go through to think about how to manage and build um, internal applications or, or, or uh, end-user applications in a new model. Um, as uh, I have learned, having been part of a few very large public clouds, DevOps is also as good as it, as it can be bad. You can, you can automate and propagate good things and bad things very, very quickly. Uh, and so understanding the, the power of DevOps is, is, is uh, critical and understanding that getting to that model of a continuous integration, continuous deployment, is really what a lot of people are searching for cloud computing to help them answer. How do they not only get something abstracted and, and, and turn that infrastructure and turn those platforms and applications into services, but how do you start working in a new model where you can update an application, let's say hundreds of times a week versus you know, five or six times a year? Uh, so very important to understand how that changes, not just the technology, but the institution, the processes, and the people inside traditional enterprise uh, IT. You hear the word hybrid quite a lot, and I had a, a, a mentor of mine uh, who's a very seasoned technologist. He said, Bill, I don't know, if it is, is hybrid computing an El Camino? Is it a new version of an operating system? Or is it some sort of newfangled car I need to buy? But saying that there's a thing called hybrid is, is extremely opaque. And so what a lot of us think of hybrid today, I think very simplistically, is hybrid means I want to move a workload or a virtual machine or an application from point A to point B, from server A environment to server B environment. And really, it's not so much about moving. It's about architecting a system that, that allows someone to use the things that they have today maybe things they have in a, in a third-party data center, maybe things they have in a public cloud or multiple public clouds, and designing a system together across those different environments, not necessarily just lifting and shifting things around. So but most importantly, uh, and, and of course, you all probably know this quote from uh, the great Bill Cosby, uh, and, and this is very true with any technology or any product, actually, is when you try to really target a, a general purpose anything, something that's completely objective of, of a specific goal, um, you end up very being, you know, striving for that mediocrity and usually su succeeding at mediocrity. And so a lot of what we're doing in, in informing our strategy at HP is how do we become very explicit, very targeted to what the enterprise is trying to solve? So you hear me say sometimes uh, provocatively or jokingly, we don't target the Snapchat users of the world or Snapchat uh, software developers of the world, we're really targeting the enterprise and what they're trying to build. Because having gone through this actually extensively with Windows Azure and with the HP Public Cloud, the more you try to serve everyone, the less you are great at anyone. Uh, and that's really, really important, I think, as a lot of you, I know a lot of you work for companies building products around OpenStack, understanding where you're going to be great at. What are you really going to focus on? Um, as we've seen with the what I'll call general purpose commodity public clouds, and commodity, I don't necessarily mean that in a derogatory way. I mean in the sense that they're, they're striving for an extremely low cost. We've seen just over the past couple months the, that price floor drop dramatically. Um, I personally think that we'll, we'll get to zero for commodity compute and storage over the next 18 months. That's my prediction. Any of you analysts out there, you have to quote me or give me a little trademark if that comes true. Um, and I think that's happening for a very specific reason because people are trying to grab subscribers, grab that, that user base early on um, as more and more customers are adopting the public cloud. So let's talk a little bit about what the enterprises face uh, today, where they're trying to understand where do I have uh, systems today, where do I have technologies today, process today, how do I get to this future? And so a very, very typical scenario I, I hear is a CIO or a CTO from an enterprise, and I mean enterprise, think of a traditional enterprise, someone that, that um, not your uh, advanced users of technology, take a you know, Midwestern manufacturing customer that uh, is, you know, squeezing by on their budget, um, and uh, that CIO goes to some cloud computing conference. Oh, and you can spit and probably hit one of these from here today in Atlanta. Uh, they go to a cloud computing conference, they hear some guy from Facebook or hear some guy from Google talk about this world where they live where everything is basically throwaway servers and they're updating Facebook Live 20 times a day and half the planet uses Facebook and they come back to their traditional enterprise environment. Nothing wrong with the Midwest, by the way, but I'm just picking the Midwest. They come back to that traditional enterprise environment and they say, how do we get to that? 
how do we get to the world where we're constantly changing applications and our, our IT is completely abstracted and we don't have to deal with these hardware vendors anymore? How do we get to this world where everything truly becomes a service? And that gap is really wide for traditional enterprise and that extreme endpoint where you're looking at someone like Facebook and are trying to sort out how do they use uh, the best of those technologies. So what do vendors do? Vendors come in and show them slides like this. They come in and say, oh, there's a public and a private cloud. I actually had one CIO tell me just recently, he said, do you know the guy who created that smart art stuff in PowerPoint? Because you vendors are really taking advantage of that too much. There's too much of these simplistic boxes uh, about private clouds or public clouds and, and some sort of magical connection, maybe some magical VPN that connects the two of them and everything is going to be hybrid and they'll be happy again. <clears throat> And they make it even more fun. Analysts give the same sort of version of this, but they use words for it instead of shapes. They'll have systems of records and systems of engagement. These are actually sort of useful mental constructs to have when you're talking to someone, but it really, really simplifies down what enterprises are dealing with, because this is what it really looks like. This is not a simple box. This is actually a real architecture from a very large airplane manufacturer of their supply chain. There's all kinds of crap in here. There's legacy stuff, there's software, there's data, there's processes, there's new stuff, there's public cloud, all kinds of, I've obfuscated it, of course, so you can't tell exactly who it is, uh, but you get the general sense. It's complicated. If you're from the South, like Atlanta, there's a word they use around here called kudzu. Does anyone know what kudzu is? Raise your hand if you do. Good, all right. Kudzu grows all over the place. Grows up your walls, in your tailpipe of your car. It's organic. Right? And a lot of enterprise IT is like kudzu, stuff that's grown up inside, along the walls, in the tailpipes over the years. And so when you come in as a vendor, you come in as a consultant, you come in to talk about technology, and you're talking about these very simple primary colors and primary shapes and say private, public, the enterprise CIO is looking at this and saying, where? Where does this fit? Where, do I just put a box in here and this magically makes it all better? Of course, it's not realistic at all. So what they're looking at is how do we create a fabric around all of this that allows them to take advantage of this tool that we're talking about called cloud computing in a way that actually fits their environment, not how they are going to shove this inside a vendor's box, because that's not happening. What gets more interesting is often what's called the Internet of Things, because a lot of enterprise IT is starting to look like this, where the endpoint is no longer a server or a box, the endpoint is a device, or in this case, a vending machine. How many of you have used the, the thing on the right? Good, a lot of you. Uh, and quite popular, I'm sure, here in Atlanta. This is quite popular. I have two teenage boys. They like to play with this machine a lot. If afterwards you want a little tip, they showed me a little keystroke where you can get to the to actually the DOS prompt on this thing and have a little fun with the, the machine. I, I know this is being recorded, so I shouldn't say that. Uh, but they're minors, I don't think they can go to jail yet for this kind of thing. So let me tell you about this machine a little bit. So this machine um, is called the Freestyle Machine, and Coca-Cola uh, would probably call this one of their most important innovations they've had at the company in a long time. And basically it's a cabinet full of syrups, little containers and vials for different syrups, grape syrup, vanilla syrup. And what you can do is pick some sort of combination, they have all sorts of different flavors, I mean thousands of flavors you can pick from and combine and create your own type of drink. And so rather than just picking between six different types of sodas, you have all, you know, I won't say infinite, but a huge variety of different uh, choices you can make. This machine is connected to a cloud application. That cloud application is basically its supply chain, understanding when the grape vial of, of syrup is getting low, it can go back to, the, actually through a partner, through a local distributor, get some more of that grape shipped to the machine in time, so it doesn't run out. So over time, they built this, this sort of three-tier sort of three -tier application of a vending machine, a cloud application that was getting data from that machine, and that application communicating down uh, to local distributors uh, to, to go fill that up. Now, that's, that's in interesting and neat. What they're doing now is, is actually quite sophisticated. They're now starting to learn from their users. They're now able to identify their user, either through NFC or, or some cases, Wi-Fi through a mobile device. It will know what combinations you like the most. You can share it with your friends. You can learn about your city, your age group, your regions. And you can now go back to a Coke machine in the future and put your, your phone up to it, and it'll automatically pour the drink that you want. It gets even better, because now that they're doing all that learning in the cloud from all these different machines, they're starting to do some analytics, and then they're starting to serve ads back through the machine as you walk up. 
specifically targeted to you and your demographic, your city. This is really creepy, by the way. You walk up to a Coke machine, and you're getting a very, very specific ad delivered to you before you pour your drink. Um, but it, it's pretty powerful when you think about it. This is hybrid cloud right here. This is what hybrid clouds look like. These machines could be shipping containers. They could be airplanes. They could be turbines. They could be restaurants. They could be shopping carts at a Walmart. So as enterprises are starting to understand, how do I really leverage a model where I have different types of endpoints, not just PCs and servers, the flexibility of the technologies that they need to use expands pretty radically. There is no simple box here that says private or public cloud. So what is, why, you know, we're here at this OpenStack conference and, and, and there's so much you know, love and affection and, 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 uh, and excitement around open source technologies. Often I get asked the question, what does open or open source in general have to do with hybrid cloud computing? Why are they connected? Why, so I understand your hybrid concept. I understand open source. How are these things connected? Uh, w one important aspect of what I'm going to show you in a minute is understanding what we've learned from history with open source over the past years. What we're seeing today in 2014 is that there is truly no one size fits all when it comes to solving a hybrid cloud computing problem. Um, we also at HP don't endorse shipping children in boxes. That's just another quick comment and disclaimer. Um, but the picture works pretty well. Uh, what we're seeing is that the first you know, wave of cloud computing driven often, uh, uh, people would cite, by, by Amazon uh, and by Salesforce in those early years, uh, that brought the idea of there's a concept of a public cloud that gives you extreme speed and very great economics, right? Not, not always price, but great economics. That doesn't fit all these scenarios. It was really good for some use cases, really good for things like Netflix or, Netflix or people doing sort of file new applications. As it tried to get the enterprise, it became more complicated, and enterprises are looking at the cloud as, I just need a tool amongst many tools that I may use. It's not going to be just one size fits all for, the, for those types of customers. So let's look at historically what happened with open source and the web. You all remember in the very beginning of, of the first time you used uh, the web and, and, um, and the internet, and most of you are old enough to remember the very early days uh, of when the web started. And you remember we used to say things back then like, let's get on the web. Let's get on the information superhighway. We used to say stuff like that. Raise your hand if you said something like that. I see every one of you, so you have to raise your hand. Every one of you said something like this. Some of you wrote about it. Some of you talked about it. We went to the web as a special location, a destination. Um, and today, we would say stuff like that. We'd look like fools saying, let's get, hey, David, let's get on the information superhighway today. Today, the web is, and, and the internet is fused into everything we do, our mobile devices, sometimes our, our embedded devices that we carry on us, our watches, uh, certainly all the different types of form factors and tablets and phablets and laptops that we walk around with. And it's just part of our, our daily experience. It's part of the way that we think of computing today. And I think the cloud is going through a very similar concept, where I think historically over the past few years, we thought about the cloud as a destination. We had to go somewhere to get there. I think in the future, it will just become the part of the way we think about computing. In many ways, what open source did with the web, in, in those early days, you remember some of the proprietary plugins that browsers used to have, the Netscape plugins that you'd have to go get, some of them for fee that you'd have to pay for. And over time, open source essentially, like software has basically eaten the technology world, open source has eaten the software world. And what's happened now, if you look at this, and you can argue about any of these numbers, but the, the story is true at any dimension, from a web server to a language to you know, what, what website today probably isn't going to default use WordPress, WordPress as at least a, a, a starting option. Um, today, the, the web is dominated by open source, not just because it's free and cheap, but because it's extremely flexible and adaptable. That's what really drives where we're at today with, with web computing and open source technologies. And that same characteristics of being adaptable and flexible are crucial for people looking to solve hybrid cloud problems. So today, when we talk to, to different types of customers about what's driving them to even consider an open source-based private cloud or an open source-based public cloud, it's really the things on the left. There's the costs, of course. They don't want vendor lock-in. They want that flexibility. But there are real concerns. There are real concerns about the maturity of, of, the, of the technologies that are available today, the security, the ecosystem around it all the things that, that enterprise customers care about. Uh, and when you're talking to a large enterprise, it's not only the technology and are the bits tested and is it gone through some sort of security process, there's also a whole range of procurement and business and legal issues that they care about as well. 
And so a lot of the things that we're doing with, at HP is how do we make this much more adaptable for, uh, for an enterprise customer to look at? And we, we've distilled it down into these core six ideas, making it some simple things, simple, as in making it easier to inst install and deploy, uh, updates and management, hardening and testing. And, and that isn't just sort of a, hey, someone ran actually some, some QA process over it, but how do you do a true, as you're, you're flowing on a river, something that moves as fast as OpenStack, how do you really go through a rigorous, continuous testing process on top of that? Uh, I'll talk about security in a moment, um, and, and that going back to the original point I made, which is how do you address not just the sysadmin and the person working in IT, how do you also address the application developer and what they're trying to get done? Um, and there's a concept that today that we work hard at at HP of making sure we're clear when we're asking for a developer, when they actually you know, make the distinction between I, I need to SSH or, or I need to RDP into a physical machine, how do we make it easier for them to have the option to do that when they need to or to never have to worry about that ever again? And so the conversations I have a lot about things like Docker are, are about that aspiration to get to the point where that developer uh, or that DevOps role has those level of choices about what they actually want to do to build that type of app. So I'm going to highlight just a few areas of where HP is involved uh, in helping solve some of these enterprise problems. I'm not going to walk through all these different ones here, but we, we look at our investment in OpenStack as something not as an interesting open source project that there's, there, there's some open source group inside HP that is dabbling with some cool technology. I hope that some of you at least saw the press or, or the announcements we made last week. OpenStack is the core operating system for cloud at HP. It is a fundamental strategic bet for the company. And for one of the largest IT providers in the world, the size of HP, our global footprint, the size of our, our, our overall business uh, across the board, that's a very big statement. So as we look across everything that we do from the physical server storage networking all the way to our public cloud, to what we do in HP software, to our, our enterprise services. Across the board, our bet on OpenStack and our investment in OpenStack is crucial to the future of HP. And so what that means is we need and will continue to invest in all different areas across projects like OpenStack and other projects too, like Cloud Foundry we're investing a lot in as well. Um, but across different areas from those, those uh, areas like install and deploy, to making sure that we build a, an operating system that can be deployed in any type of delivery model. And so there's a fundamental tenet that I have uh, and our engineering teams have, which is our OpenStack distribution, what we're building called HP Helion, which I'll talk to you in a moment, must run on a private cloud, a public cloud, managed by us, managed by a customer, in a service provider, behind an enterprise firewall, the same distribution will have to run in any of those environments. And that's really important for us. Uh, one of the things I was involved with early at IBM, I was part of uh, uh, the Linux group at IBM years ago, and getting to the point where Linux became a common denominator across the very large business of IBM, across all the different hardware businesses that IBM had, was not only cathartic for a company the size of IBM, it was actually revolutionary because it, it aligned basically multiple hardware and software groups on a common platform which allowed for a, a lot of leverage when you're at, working at a very large company. Uh, so in these areas, you'll see us investing our booth out there. You can talk to our different, we have our architects out there that are in these different projects. Uh, and as we mentioned last week, we're investing a billion dollars uh, over the next two years in these areas, uh, in, in hiring people for everything from working on OpenStack as a developer to testing and QA to consulting services around the world as people want to go and work with enterprise customers to build and deploy uh, uh, OpenStack in their environments. And one of the funny things is someone told me, like, well, everyone says a billion dollars. I'm like, well, yeah, not, not, not really. Not everyone says a billion dollars. A billion dollars is still a lot of money. Um, let pe you know, the big vendors love to do a lot of marketing. We actually spent a lot of time actually counting up what that would really look like, not just making up some cool slides. Uh, so security is a, is a crucial area for OpenStack in general and really important, probably the number one requirement we hear from customers that we talk to about, about cloud computing is that the, not just the concern or perception about security, but specifically what are you doing uh, to address some of these issues. Um, there are a variety of projects that, that either we, we help found uh, originally in, in the OpenStack community or that we participate in heavily. The vulnerability management team, I don't know if any of you are a part of that. 
um, an incredibly important part of the OpenStack community, identifying uh, critical security vulnerabilities and a process to work with the development community on, on, on fixing those. Um, the OpenStack security group, this is a really critical area for customers because there's a lot of things that aren't just simple bug fixes. There are a lot of things that come down to configurations uh, or reference architectures of how you do a deployment um, or, or basic settings in, in certain projects. Uh, and building those security notes and, and the OpenStack security guide uh, was very, very important for us. There, the last two things I want to call out are, are pretty specific to, to HP and what we do. We're one of the largest security companies in the world. We have a, a range of security products from uh, you know, static and, and dynamic code analysis tools that we have with Fortify to firewalls and intrusion detection systems, the th things that we have with ArcSight, uh, to Tipping Point and, and a variety of other security products we have across the board. We take those products and the learnings from those products, and, we're in, and we have been and will continue to apply those towards the OpenStack community uh, and OpenStack customers that, that we're working with. Uh, and those come from a variety of things that we see from harvesting huge amounts of information from enterprise customers about what's happening uh, around security and vulnerability and being able to leverage that uh, with our customers and build solutions that allow them to take advantage of some of those products along with OpenStack. An example of that is a product we have today called Cloud System. It's an integrated hardware uh, software appliance, so to speak, um, uh, and we sell quite a bit of these. Uh, today, and so we build that with these tools like ArcSight, Tipping Point, and Fortify that ship around our OpenStack distribution inside of that integrated product called Cloud System. So you've heard uh, about, uh, or you may have heard uh, about HP Helion, um, and if you really want to blame anyone for that name, if you really don't like it, um, I'll pick on some people in the audience that, that helped me make that decision. Um, uh, it's not Hellion, a lot of people thought it was Hellion. Um, uh, th there's another L for Hellion. Uh, the reason why we picked this name, and, and actually it doesn't really matter if you like it or not, uh, because it's what we picked. Uh, the reason why this name is important to us is we wanted a, a single, uh, common, unifying brand that would describe the entire portfolio of everything that we're doing around the cloud at HP, from products to services um, to you know, what we're doing in hardware to what we're doing in the public cloud. Uh, and we wanted it to be unique, and we wanted it to be something that represented what we thought was beyond just calling it cloud computing. And so when you see these little cloudy things at the top from private to managed, pri private managed virtual all the way to public cloud, again, what I was saying earlier, for us, our portfolio is to help a customer solve any or, or one or any of those. So we have lots of customers that will say to us, I, I will never go beyond my own firewall, but I need all that speed and, and the, the economics of a cloud in my own private cloud deployment. I have, we have some customers that say, you manage our IT for us. We, we actually outsource a lot of uh, large enterprises, outsource their IT to HP to run on behalf uh, of them, and, and they want those same capabilities in a managed environment. Then we have some customers who only want to consume. They only want storage as a service from us. They only want to have some, some compute as a service, some VMs in a, in a public cloud. Uh, and we needed to have a platform that allowed a customer not only to choose any of those given delivery models, but also when they want to bring them together, we had a composable stack, again, not just an IPsec connection between two different servers, a composable stack that allowed them to build something that was truly hybrid. And so we, we under, under the, the our common architecture of, of having it, these are principles of being open, secure, and agile, so that in any of those delivery models, uh, a customer has that choice. And part of that announcement was uh, a, an actual product. Uh, you'll see us announce you know, quite a few products under this HP Helion brand over the months and years. Uh, our first drop of this was last week uh, of what we call Helion OpenStack Community. And so this is a free and downloadable uh, version. Um, the product manager for it is right there holding a camera at me. His name is Raj. Raise your hand. If you have any questions, you ask Raj about it. Um, this is our first true full product of, of OpenStack that, that we're distributing uh, based on Icehouse. Uh, and we, we, you can download it today. There's the URL for it. I'll show you the URL again at the end. Um, this is really designed for pilots and proof of concepts, mainly uh, up to 30 nodes. We'll be releasing a, a commercial version uh, in the next month. Um, uh, of our OpenStack distribution um, that will use that same core, uh, but we'll be building a variety of things around that core. Uh, there was someone who mentioned, I think on Twitter the other day, that uh, uh, is OpenStack becoming this vanilla 
you know, commodity, open source thing in the middle, and I think the, the actual words were, and all the chocolatey goodness around the edges is going to be commercialized. Uh, did any of you tweet that? I think, it, I think it might have been an analyst. Chocolatey goodness was particularly provocative. I thought that was good. Um, and I, well, I'm going to talk about it again about how we work with, with the OpenStack community and the things that we see happening in OpenStack and where that, that gap will be and that delta will be for commercialization around it. Um, but this was part of our release last week, and you can, you can check it out on that website. I'm not going to take you through, I only have 10 minutes left, all, all the things that we're doing. We, we've been a part of the OpenStack community since the inception. Uh, we uh, have, like I said, it's, it's not so much about the booth or the amount of money or the t-shirts that we spend here. I think the most important point I would leave you with is OpenStack has become, over the past couple years, one of the most important strategic elements for HP's turnaround across all of the company. Uh, and so against that, we do a variety of these different resources and investments. A couple that I'll talk about here that are interesting is, we, yes, number two, number three, three, you know, this many PTLs, this many, that's all great. One of the things that we do that we're really proud of is we actually run the OpenStack infrastructure project, the actual continuous integration and deployment project for OpenStack, the, the, the development project itself in our public cloud. Um, and we learn a lot from that, actually. We learn a lot about how the, how the community works and how CICD um, truly does happen on the, uh, I, I think it's safe to say this, uh, the fastest growing open source project in history to date. I'm, maybe there's someone who can, who can question that, but I believe it is still true. Uh, and so doing that's important for us. So we have dedicated staff, and this isn't glossy or glamorous. This isn't stuff that we go out and tell customers, hey, we run the back end for the OpenStack development process, but it's really important for the community that someone steps up and does that level of work. Uh, so we'll continue to do this. This slide will only get better for us as we continue to invest in, in, in OpenStack overall. So let me start to wrap up here uh, and talk about what it's like to build a, a cloud business with open source. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate to be able to do this a few different times. Uh, ironically, I, I got to do this a few times at Microsoft, which you, you may think is sort of uh, uh, oil and water, um, but it was a good training ground of how you actually can really apply open source, even in the most, uh, in some cases, the most proprietary type of environments. One of our core principles is that we work upstream wherever we can, as fast as we can, as broadly as we can. And the reason we believe in that is we believe that doing more work upstream does not equal lost revenue. And I hear a lot of vendors, I talk to people at VMware, Red Hat, EMC, anyone out there, I have friends at every one of these companies. Uh, and there's always a concern is, the more I work upstream, am I giving away an opportunity? Am I giving away to harvest more money from a customer where I can make that proprietary or make that special only to me, be it a driver for specific, for specific hardware or something higher up the stack? Um, and the, the more that we do that as a community, the more damage we cause to OpenStack. And we've actually seen that in some projects. Uh, I won't call them out, but some projects you know, over the past couple of years where the, the vendor gravity becomes very heavy and pulls people down to a proprietary level, uh, and then the core of OpenStack suffers from that. Um, so we do believe that the better OpenStack is, the, better, the more opportunity we as a company have to make revenue. I'll give you another really important point. Spend more time on your business, I know there's a lot of vendors out here, spend more time on your business model than you are today. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, I'm just saying you should probably spend a lot more time on that business model as you think through how do you harvest something from, from OpenStack. I'm not going to give you the secret because I'm also a vendor. There is no magic secret here. You have to understand how you will transform your business with something like this. Customers are going through a transformation right now, and so the way that you model that future business will also have to be transformative. Many people come from an old business model and they try to basically lipstick it in a new world and jam some OpenStack in there. It's not going to work. Because once a customer gets the taste of what the cloud can really do for them, many customers already have it today from Amazon or Azure or maybe even Google. Once they understand that new way of consuming, that new way of paying for something, if you don't meet them there, you will lose. If you try to build, ch charge them or, or, or capture them in an old world model, you will be quickly outdated and it will show up very, very fast. The last thing I'll say about working, and the reason why there's a little salmon here jumping up the stream, is make sure, and this probably isn't very perfect for a video or a rebroadcast, don't pee upstream. This is a good rule. I fish a lot in rivers. I'm a big fly fisherman. I never pee upstream. It's just not a good thing. It might be warm for a little bit, but after that, it's not good. 
The reason why being upstream is bad is this is a very open community. People can see what's happening. If you've watched sort of the, there's been some great battles between vendor A, vendor B, is someone becoming more proprietary or not? Did we do the right thing with Neutron? I don't know what's happening. I love it. I love that there's all this competition happening now. I'll tell you a personal story. A couple years ago, I went my first OpenStack summit I went to as essentially a competitor. I went to Portland when I was a, a GM of, of product management for Azure. I went to do some com competitive intelligence in Portland. I went down there, went to all the different sessions, uh, came back and talked to some of my peers and like, hey, are we worried about this OpenStack thing? We got to be concerned about this? I go, we're good. We're good. Don't worry about this OpenStack thing. Everyone is way too happy. Everyone is, like every session I went to, everyone's getting along. Everyone's talking, it's, it's, it's too much rah-rah. And how many of you worked on a technical project where everyone was always right and everyone was nodding their head in every meeting and everyone was happy and it was all going swimmingly? Those usually don't turn out to be really great technical projects. What I love about this week is it's not going so great anymore. It's getting a little dirty and nasty, right? And people are starting to get, you know, tweet nasty things to each other and say, I don't think that's working the right way. This is good, people. This is good stuff. When the community is actually competing, the community is pointing out the problems and identifying things out in the open, this is how software gets better. And so I, I'm, I'm actually quite happy to see it. Even someone sent me a note, like, I don't know. The, you know. Company A said company B is getting too proprietary. I'm like, this is good. This is good, healthy competition. And customers love this because they know now it's getting more real. Like things aren't landing well at scale. We run OpenStack at big scale in our public cloud. We see a lot of problems customers don't see. They want us to go through that pain. When I talk to real customers, they say, tell me the real problems you have in your public cloud. Let's walk through those. Don't tell me about all your marketing slides and the good stuff. Tell me the real issues you're running into. Uh, so overall, what I'd say is understand why we have to work upstream as a community deeply. Because every one of us, I presume, is hooked into the success of OpenStack to some degree or investigating it. And the more that we don't pee upstream, uh, the more that we work collaboratively, the better. And remember, for those of you who are vendors, peeing downstream is fine. Like, I got a whole bunch of my team in this room. That's fine. I can go tell them the hard stuff to work on and go to yell and bark at these guys. That's fine. But understand that as a community, we actually have to solve together, not just fight. So lastly, I'll just leave you with the bit.ly URL you can see there. Um, this is our community edition. That's our new name and our, and our, and our new, new logo. Uh, and, it, you know, just wrapping up really quickly, um, I wanted to give you a sense not just of what we're doing on, but also where I, where I see uh, OpenStack is today. Um, you will hear a lot more from us uh, over the weeks and months about what we're doing under this brand name and our investments in OpenStack overall. Uh, but with that, I'll say thank you, uh, and I enjoyed the time here with all of you.